uh, turning in your Bible, let me lay this big thought on you. Uh, God has a plan for every person. Do you understand that? Uh, God has a plan for every person. God has uh, a, a very uh, powerful plan for uh, every person uh, here. Every person listening on video, every person in this room, God has a plan for every person. Turn to your neighbor and tell them that. Say, God has a plan for you. God has a plan for you. In Jeremiah uh, 29, it says, I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. God knows the plan he has for you. He knows it. Say that. Say, he knows it. Now, we don't always know it, uh, even as evidenced by the announcement I just made, but God knows it. Uh, God knows the plan he has for us. Now, God's plan for you involves uh, three main categories, all right? Uh, first of all, what he wants to do for you, okay? God doesn't just want to forgive your sins. He wants to give you a future and a hope. So God's plan involves what he wants to do for you. Secondly, uh, God's plan involves uh, what he wants to do in you. God doesn't just want to save you. God doesn't just want to save you. He wants to change you. Uh, he wants to uh, do some things for you. That's the first thing. He wants to do some things in you. That's the second category of his plan. And the third thing, he wants to do some things, do you know, do you know? Through you. God wants to do some things for you, some things uh, in you, and God wants to do some things through you. He doesn't want to just impact your life. He wants to impact others through you. Now, um, I've been doing this uh, pastor thing for a while. So let me just tell you how those kites fly with people. When you tell people God wants to do some things uh, for you, uh, uh, people like that a lot. They're like, for me? God, God wants to do some things for me? Uh, a plus. Uh, more is better. Uh, bring it on, God. Here's a funnel so we don't spill any. And, and come on, God. And people love that. God wants to do some things for me. Then when you get to uh, God wants to do some things in you, Okay, okay. Um, everybody needs some improvement, and I suppose, uh, hypothetically at least, um, I could use some work, a, a tune-up maybe, I, I guess. So, fine, fine. Keep that farming stuff coming, God, and if you want to do some things in me. Okay. Now, when it gets to through you, um, God, listen to me, part of God's plan is he wants to do some things through you. People are like, Pastor James and Kathy maybe, he wants to do some things through them, but mainly for me it's just stuff he wants to do for me and in me, if he has to. But not through me. Maybe Andy or, or Jacob and Meredith or, or Lindsay or Luke or someone I see, you know, that, that seems to have a lot of through me kinds of gifts, but, but most Christians are not embracing with their whole heart this part of God's plan for them. That God doesn't just want to do things for you and in you. He wants to do things, tell me, through you. He does. Now, the reason why most people are not on that program is because they're insecure. They don't see the potential of what God wants to do. They're focused on their weaknesses. They're focused on their failures. They're focused on their shortcomings. And as a result of that, most Christians do not even begin to approximate the things that God wants to do not just for you, not just in you, but lift up your voice and say it, through you, all right? Now, what's in the way there is insecurity. And the antidote to insecurity, as all points of identity struggle, is I am. I am finding your identity in God. I'm changing the title of this message. I'm calling it Conquering Insecurity. So cross out my bad plan in your notes and put my good one down. I'm calling this Conquering Insecurity, and uh, we've prayed already, we've opened our Bibles already, Exodus chapter 4, verse 1. Then Moses answered 
but behold, they will not believe me. See, God had given Moses a job to do. You know Moses? You picture Moses, Ten Commandments guy, big Moses, tablet of stone coming down from the mountain. Got that? Got Moses, okay? So we're going to look at Moses' insecurity and see if maybe we can't learn some things ourselves. In chapter 3, verse uh, 10, God had said to him, Come, I will send you to Pharaoh that you may bring my people, the children of Israel, out of Egypt. But Moses answered, But they will not believe me or listen to my voice, for they will say, The Lord did not appear to you. Now, um, he's insecure. Let's get a definition on the table just because I think that helps us learn better. Um, insecurity, frankly, is easier to experience than it is to define. Do you know what it is to feel insecure? I feel insecure when I go to this group of high-powered pastors, you can look it up online, called the Gospel Coalition. I'm even on the board of the Gospel Coalition now, but when I get in a room with Tim Keller and Don Carson and Mark Dever and John Piper, I frankly feel insecure. They are so smart, it's scary. They write books that I can't even understand without reading them several times, and I'm just telling you, I, I feel um, insecure. I feel insecure when I uh, go down to the gym and, and uh, the guys here at Harvest are playing basketball, and, and I look at how fast they run and how high they jump, and I think to myself, uh, as uh, they are, I was, <laughs> as I am, they will be, <laughs> but for right now, I feel, um, I feel insecure uh, about that. Um, I feel insecure on Thursday mornings when I walk through one of our campuses and I see hundreds of women around tables and, and women mothers, and they're all doing their thing, and I walk through and I can feel all their eyes on me, and I'm like, this is not my place here. This is, this is not my place. I, I feel insecure sometimes when I come on Thursday nights, and there's hundreds of 20-somethings of in this room, and I'm not young, and I'm not cool, and, and I feel the gap between what they are and what I am, I feel uh, insecure. Um, anybody else with me on this? I feel a little um, right now, because you're all like, really? 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 <laughs> How many people here feel some insecurity sometimes? Um, um, let's get a definition. Here it is. Insecurity is the Awareness, let's call it the uneasy, unsettled, fearful awareness. Uh, insecurity is the awareness of the gap between who I want to be and who I am. Sometimes I feel a gap. How many people feel the gap? <laughs> Put up your hand if you feel the gap. Come on. I feel the gap sometimes. Because, listen, I think a picture's better. This is, this is, this is me and Kathy. sort of, and this is the gap, uh, the space between who we need to be, who we want to be, what the situation calls for. When you've got that going on, that's insecurity right there, okay? Uh, that's uh, exactly what it is. Now, um, you, I'll go back to the basketball analogy, and uh, sometimes, here, let me get this. Sometimes the basketball, I played a lot of basketball in my lifetime. And um, I used to be able to do that. So I go by the gym, and I think to myself, um, um, I I'm going to do this. It, it doesn't matter. I'm going to close the gap, man. I'm going to close the gap. And, and, but, but my bad knees and my out of breath and, and yeah, that's not working. So, so then, sometimes the way I close the gap is not by trying to get over it. Sometimes I try to close the gap by saying, um, um, I don't care anymore. I'm spiritual now. <laughs> I, I, don't, I, don't, I don't wish I could. I don't, you know what? I don't even miss that. So sometimes we try to close the gap by pressing over it. Sometimes we try to close the gap by saying, I don't care about that. And that, and that doesn't work. 
Uh, sometimes we, we try to close the gap by saying, I'm going to fix it. I'm going I'm to get so that I'm better at this. And, and, and you know, I, I used to be able to dunk a basketball. Then all do, during my 30s, I could jump up and hang on the rim, and then I could touch the rim, and then I could almost touch the net. <laughs> um, all of those are bad plans, okay? I can't... Uh, power up over it. I can't uh, say I don't care anymore. I can't uh, fix it. The fact is, uh, let's go back to our picture there. The fact is there's a gap, okay? There's a gap. And, and, and I feel it. Everyone say, I feel it. When you're feeling the space between who you know you are and who uh, you want to be in a given situation, uh, that's where insecurity uh, comes. Now, everyone battles insecurity. Uh, Moses, for example, here uh, in the text, I mean, we'd be like, come on, Moses, you were born for a purpose. You were raised in the palace. You were called by God. You're 80 years old. Get it together. Um, but I think the honesty of Scripture here really blows me away. Let's go into the text now, and I want to pull out from verse 1, from verse 10, and from verse 13 uh, some elements of Moses' insecurity. And then with your permission, I want to circle back through the text and I want to show you how, uh, all in favor of how God helped him with that. But first, a fuller understanding of the problem. Uh, uh, so we've been understanding insecurity. I jot this down. First of all, pattern insecurity. Pattern insecurity. This is where we feel, you know, I'm not believable. And God had given Moses a job to do. And so this is pretty incredible here. God's like, you're going to lead my people uh, out of Egypt back to the promised land, chapter 4, verse 1. But behold, Moses answered, behold, that's a funny thing to say to God. I'd strike that from all prayer language. Okay? Don't ever tell God to look at something. That seems a little redundant. Look at this, God. Check this out, God. Try to avoid informing God in your prayers. Let's just go with he knows. Everyone say he knows. Moses isn't thinking very clearly here. Behold, they will not believe me or listen to my voice. They will not uh, believe me. They're, they're going to be like, Moses, you're, 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 you're having dreams. You're, 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 you're not sleeping. Take some NyQuil. You're, you're, you, you're, you're not sleeping through the night, Moses. You're imagining things. They're not going to let me lead them, God. I'm going to show up there. And, and, and they're not going to believe, they're not going to listen to me. They're going to be like, aren't you that guy? Like, I'm, I heard a story about you. Or, Did, weren't you raised in the palace? Did you have to run away a while ago because you murdered some? We know who you are. And so he feels the gap. They're not, they're not going to let me lead them. They're not going to receive me. Moses can imagine their response. He can hear their ridicule. He can feel their rejection. And when you feel that gap so strongly, Moses says, in effect, you want me to be a spiritual leader for a lot of people, but I know that they know that I'm far from perfect. You want me to do something, God, but I know that the people you want to work through me to impact, I know that they know that I'm not perfect, God. That's going to make it kind of hard. We feel insecure. Dads feel insecure about their kids. It's hard to lead my kids spiritually. It's hard to gather them around and open God's Word with my kids because I know that they know that I'm not perfect. It's hard for me to pray with my wife because I know that she knows that I'm not perfect. It's hard for me to give myself to my husband because I know that he knows that I'm not perfect. It's hard for me to keep trying here at work because some of the feedback that I've got is that they know that I'm not perfect. And I know they know. And so I feel a, uh, what's the word? It starts with G. What do I feel? I feel a gap. It's hard for me. I, I, I'm not believable. Now, 
Again, two things can come here. Uh, jot them down. One is paralysis. I just lay down. I just give up. I just fold up. There's a gap. I can't do anything about it. And we get paralyzed. We do nothing. I'm not believable. People will laugh at me if I try to make an impact for God. People will ridicule me. They'll reject me. And that's going to hurt. And I don't want it. So I'm going to pull back into myself and do less because I'm insecure. The other thing, not paralysis, but spoken of already is I'm going to power over that. I'm going to, we know those people who are so over the top, demonstrative, going so far out of their way to show you how capable they are. Now, their problem is really not different than the paralysis person. Some people try to power over their insecurity and act like it's not there. Some people pull back, but either person is struggling with the same thing. And Okay, I'm comforted by the fact that Moses had this problem. Anybody else find that kind of cool? I'm good with that. And I'm glad the Bible didn't hide that, and I'm glad that God didn't skip this chapter. This guy's about to rock the world. But he wasn't so sure that God could even use him. His past patterns made him insecure. He felt he would be unbelievable. Hey, thanks, Harvest, for an un unbelievable, undeserved, mind-blowing, massively encouraging 50th birthday. Thank you. It meant so much to me, and this time last week we were heading into a service where 15 or 20 people showed up. I hadn't seen some of them in so long. And, and to, to, to hear them say that somehow God had used me in their life, really, honestly, it blew me away. One of the guys was this guy, John Doyle, if you were here. Now, John Doyle, he looks like a game show host, right? John Doyle was the most handsome, the most articulate, the most, uh, the best preacher from the biggest church in my doctor of ministry program. He had it going on big time in the mid-90s. And it was several years ago now where the phone rang and John said, I gotta, I gotta talk to you. And we'd remain friends and and I'd even had the privilege of preaching in his church out in Arizona, and, and Harvest was so small compared to the great work that he allowed me to be part of that weekend. And, but he fell morally, sexually, and he lost his ministry, and he lost everything. By that time, he wasn't in Arizona anymore. He was in Ohio. He was in Columbus. He fell flat on his face. He blew it mega. And I can say it because if you were here last week, he said it. What now, John? Moses was a murderer. He didn't roll it up. John was a moral failure. He didn't roll it up. He got a job and worked on his marriage and humbled himself, got involved in a great church in Columbus, Ohio, got involved in an addiction ministry and began to get the help that he needed. And with all of his skills and all of his knowledge over months, became years, he became one of the leaders of the ministry, then a leader of the ministry. He's written curriculum to help men with that. Uh, it's unbelievable what God's done in his life. Tomorrow uh, we're starting the Harvest Bible Chapel of Columbus. John found out about that. He's been working behind the scenes with the man and woman that we've sent out there, doing everything he can to help them. He did not use his failure as an excuse to stop serving God. He's not a pastor now. He may never be one again, but he loves the Lord, and he's working for the Lord, and he has my highest respect and esteem for not letting his past limit his future. Are you listening? Because some of you let your past limit your future. 
And you feel, well, I've fallen, I've failed people, know things about me. My family knows, my children know, my spouse knows, I can't serve God, I'm not everything. Insecurity, you feel the gap, and it causes paralysis like it was in Moses. Not good. Not acceptable. Hear me. Understandable. How many people would understand if John had just quit for a long time? Put up your hand if you would have understood that. I would have understood. Understandable, but not what? Not acceptable. He did the better thing. God bless him for that. Here's the second category. Pattern insecurity, I'm not believable. Performance insecurity. Performance insecurity, I'm not capable. Look down, God's answer comes to him in the verses. We're going to go back for those, but down in verse 10. But Moses said to the Lord, Oh, my Lord, I am not eloquent, either in the past or since you have spoken to your servant, but I am slow of speech and of tongue. Moses is like, I, 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 I don't t t talk goodly. Really, Moses? And then he goes on, not only to say that he doesn't talk well, but either in the past or since you have spoken to your servant. I, I, I'm not good at talking, and not, not, not in the past, nor since, since, since you showed up in that bur burning bush. What's he saying? You want to use me, God, but you haven't fixed me. You want to use me, God, but you know my weakness and you haven't fixed me. And I have a problem that I've had since birth. You know what it is? You, 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 you know what it is, God. It's always been that way in the past. And since you've spoken to your servant, now, the issue here is capability. Sometimes we're insecure not about our believability, about our credibility, not about our integrity. Sometimes we are insecure about our capability. Hey, James, I got as good a reputation as anybody. I'm just not good at anything. The issue is capability. Now, here's two things about capability I want you to know. Here's the first one. Number one, everyone has things about which they feel insecure. Everyone. I'm sure it's going to surprise our church family to know this, but people who know me personally know it's true. I get so nervous every single weekend when I have to preach. Every single weekend. Come here for a second, Ross. Would you describe my hands as, come here, touch my hands. Clammy, right? A little damp, he says. <laughs> I have to go to the bathroom so many times every single weekend before I get up here to preach. Truth, all right? Everyone has things. Turn to your neighbor and say everyone. Everyone has these things, all right? Everyone has a feeling of weakness, a feeling of frailty, a, a feeling of, I can't do this, God. I'm not, I, I'm, 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 not, I'm, not, I'm, I'm not good at this, God. Lift up your voice and say, everyone. Stop kidding yourself into thinking that you're the only person who feels those things. We all feel it. Everyone has things about which they feel insecure. I've, my kids have got me playing this fantasy football thing. And last weekend was a bad weekend for me because I came to the end of the weekend playing against one of, the, one of uh, Luke and Landon's friends, and uh, his players were all done on Sunday, but I had three players going in. How many people know what fantasy football even is? Do you know? Some of you know? The rest of you, just try, try to follow me. <laughs> what you do is you pick a bunch of different players from all different teams, and what they do, catching passes, running for touchdowns, what they do adds up points for your team. You have your own team from all the teams, and one of my players was Randy Moss, one of the greatest receivers of all time. Randy Moss is talented, talented, mega talented, all right? And, and uh, so I was going into Monday night. I had Randy Moss and a running back. I only needed like 10 points or something. And first time in history, Randy Moss 
Not only does not get a touchdown, not only does not catch a lot of passes, did not catch one pass, not one, not one, not one, not one. <laughs> I'm bitter, I lost, I lost. But he lost even more. He, one of the greatest receivers of all time was so steamed that he didn't catch a pass, so insecure, so proving his performance every week that he went in the next day and demanded to be traded. Demanded to be traded. So now he's traded to the Minnesota Vikings. He's going to be playing with Brett Favre, the bastion of security. <laughs> They're going to be on the same team now. Here's the point I'm trying to make. You'd think that one of the greatest receivers of all time wouldn't feel like he had to prove it every week. Wouldn't feel like his entire ego had been trashed just because he didn't catch a pass in one game. It wasn't like he dropped them. He, they, he wasn't even thrown to. Everyone, 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 everyone. And God's not going to be able to do much through you until you embrace with your whole heart. Everyone feels it. Here's the second thing about capability. Everyone has things about which they feel insecure. Secondly, innate capability is an illusion. We tend to look at other people who are greatly used by God. We tend to look at other people who are, 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 are greatly impacting others and the world for Christ. And we tend to think, well, they were born with that. They have innate ability that I don't have. If I had those talents, if I had those abilities, I would do more to serve God and to impact this world. I don't have what they have. Um, that is incorrect. Our oldest son, Luke, uh, is a great reader, and he frequently puts a good book in my hands, a book that he uh, challenged me to read uh, recently. It was by Malcolm Gladwell. Uh, the book is called uh, Outliers. Um, I, I can give you the whole scoop here. Luke wrote me a summary because I said, Luke, you, you'll, you'll do this better than me. Malcolm Gladwell's Outliers explains the factors behind great success. Most memorably is the rule of 10,000 hours. No matter what the subject, music, sales, sports, computer programming, true mastery is only achieved after 10,000 hours of effort. The amount of talent someone possesses does not provide any shortcut for perfecting a skill. Rather, Gladwell compellingly argues that above a certain necessary level of aptitude, the single greatest contributing factor to success is simply the amount of time spent working on it. Our society loves to mythologize the innate gifts of the Tiger Woods, the John Lennons, who would have been 70 today, the Bill Gates, of every field, but the most common shared trait between these types of geniuses is the tireless effort they give to their goal. Effort, effort, not innate ability. And if you feel insecure, like Moses did, about your abilities, I'm not capable, Moses said. I'm not believable. I'm not capable. Moses made two mistakes. He thought his ins Moses made two mistakes. He thought his insecurities were unique, but everyone has them. He thought the key to success was capability, when in reality, it's effort. And here's the third insecurity. Go over to verse 13. Skip over God's answer to him again. Verse 13, but he said, oh, my Lord, please send someone else. Let's get the flow here. Moses says, they won't believe me. And God gives his answer. Moses says, okay, then I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't I'm not capable. Pull. And God gives him the answer. And then he says, send someone else. So really, at the end of the day, it, it was his personal insecurity personal insecurity. I'm not available. Not I'm not believable. Not I'm not capable. At the end of the line, Moses' biggest deal was, I'm not available. I'm not available, God. Send someone else. He was hiding behind the other things. Notice that Moses agreed that God's will was right. He didn't say this, is, this shouldn't happen. We don't need the children of Israel back in the promised land. He didn't say that. 
He didn't say that the plan was wrong. He agreed that God's plan was right. He just questioned God's HR decision. He said, God, the plan's perfect. It's the person you chose that's wrong. Now, isn't it that way so often with us? Jot this down. Be careful of agreeing with God in the abstract, but refusing him in the reality. Write that down, please, if you like to take notes. Be careful of agreeing with God in the abstract, but denying God in the reality. Say, what do you mean? Say that. Say, what do you mean? What I mean is, I'll give you some examples. In John chapter 4, we're told that God is seeking worshipers. Everyone agrees with that. Part of God's will is for me to be growing in worship. Part of God's will is for you to be growing in worship. Part of God's will is for you and you and you and you and you and you and you to be growing in worship. That's God's will. Everyone agrees with that in principle. But let me just ask you this. Are you a better, more sincere, more fervent worshiper than you were a year ago or five years ago? Are you? I'm not saying you are or aren't. I think the question is appropriate. Beware of agreeing about God's will in the abstract, but not getting on it in reality. Another example, Matthew 28, go make disciples. How many people would agree that Jesus sent his followers out in the world to make disciples? Question, who are you discipling? So many of you know so much. Who are you personally pouring your life into? I felt convicted about this. I told you a couple of months ago I was going to get back into a small group. I'm in two. And in one of them in particular, I'm pouring myself into some young baby Christians to grow them up in the Lord. I'm teaching them the most. This is a Bible. This is where you turn. This is how you pray. This is how you memorize Scripture. All right? Now, there's probably not a sincere Christian here that wouldn't agree that God calls us to make disciples. Who are you discipling? There'll be almost a 1,000 people baptized in our church this year. Again, young Christians, we heard some of them today, desperately needing someone to pour into them. Our staff goes out every week and shakes the trees. But sincere Christians agree with God in the abstract, but refuse to obey him in reality about worship, about discipleship. Matthew 5, 16 says, Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. Do you agree with that? Do you agree with that? Do you agree with that? Are you doing it? I'm trying. Understanding insecurity. Turn the page. Conquering insecurity. Let's go back for God's answers now. That's what makes all the difference. You say, James, you've already acknowledged that insecurity is real. I want to be a worshiper, a disciple, or a, a light. I just, I just don't, I feel insecure. I just don't feel up to it. All right? What's the problem, really? Well, well who am I to teach someone else? Okay, that right there. That's the insecurity. That's it. But, but who am I, really? Like, I know all of my... Get over yourself. Get over yourself. There's no perfect people here. But I just thought I'd be further along before I started. You'll get further along by starting. Okay? That's how it happens. I tell you, the church is, our church is filled with people who somehow got corralled off the sideline into the work of God, and it, I got looking at them, and it changed their life. All right? You got to jump over that part. Who am I? Let me just help you with the answer to that question. Uh, nobody is the answer. That's why I like coming to Harvest, man. I get so encouraged. <laughs> You're a nobody. You're a nobody. Have the funeral for that, okay? I like my friend Mark Driscoll uh, on his Twitter. He describes himself in this way. A nobody trying to tell everybody about somebody. Bam! That's it. That's it. I'm a nobody. Say it. 
Just get over it. It's okay. All right? I'm not famous. I'm not known. I want to be faithful. I want to be faithful. I want to be a growing worshiper. I want to be a light. I want to be a discipler of others. That's all there is. You say, well, James, but I just feel the gap so strongly. Let's talk about, again, things that don't fill it. Even if you were believable, even if you said, I am good enough, I'm believable, I am smart enough, I'm capable, I am strong enough, I am available, still, still, there's a gap. Everyone say there's a gap. All right? Those things don't fill the gap. Only God closes the gap between me and something that needs to be done. Only God can do that. Only God can close the gap. And that's what you're going to see here as we go back to God's answers. So remember verse 1 where he said, they won't believe me or listen to me? Check out God's answer, Exodus 4, 2. The Lord said to him, what is that in your hand? Which God does have some funny questions, doesn't he? <laughs> Moses is like, they won't believe me. They won't listen to me. And God's like, what's that in your hand? <laughs> um, it's a stick. <laughs> but notice what he does with it. God always just takes what we have, right? Check this. He's like, um, what is that in your hand? He said, a staff. And he said, throw it on the ground. So he threw it on the ground. It became a serpent, a miracle. And Moses ran from it, insecure. But the Lord said to Moses, put your hand out and catch it by the tail. So he put out his hand and caught it, and it became a staff in his hand. Notice verse 5. Why, why'd you do that, God? Why'd you do that miracle? That they may believe that the Lord, the God of the fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob has appeared to you. He gave Moses a miracle. He gave, look up here. He gave Moses a miracle, all right? Jot this down. I am the Lord. Tell your story about us. Moses uh, is moving from, notice that every time in the text he refers to the Lord as lowercase o-r-d, Elohim, uh, almighty, ruler. Never does Moses in the text refer to him as capitalized l-o-r-d, Yahweh. He's moving from a concept about God. Look up here for a sec. He's moving from a concept about God to a personal covenant relationship with God. You have to have that second part growing to conquer insecurity. And so he gives them, him that miracle, but then another one. Again, the Lord said to him, put your hand inside your cloak, verse 6, and he put his hand in his cloak, and when he took it out, his hand was leprous like snow. Now he has two stories to tell. Then God said, put your hand back inside your cloak. So he put his hand back inside his cloak, and when he took it out, behold, it was restored like the rest of his flesh. If they will not believe you, God said, or listen to the first sign, they may believe the latter sign. If they will not believe even these two signs or listen to your voice, take some water from the Nile, pour it on the dry ground. The water that you shall take from the Nile will become blood on the dry ground. All right, three miracles, three miraculous provisions that Moses now has as part of his story, as part of his confidence as he sets out to be used by God. Question, do you have a story? I tried to get back to some earlier times in my ministry as I prepared this message to think about where I was when I was sitting where a lot of you are. Not having served God a lot, not having done a lot to be used by God. And you know when I didn't have much of a story, what I used to do was I used to read the stories of other people who had a story. Early in my Christian life, the biography of Keith Green, which is in our bookstore, uh, the biography of Hudson Taylor, here's a great guy. Anybody ever even heard of Hudson Taylor? Put up your hands if you've heard of him. So such a few of you actually even know who that is. He was one of the greatest missionaries in the history of the church. He died, I think, in like 1905. He started the China Inland Mission, which became OMF, Overseas Missionary Fellowship. Uh, this guy's life of work for the Lord and sacrifice. I remember one particular story that he had where he was serving the Lord and he ran out of money. Just ran out, no more money, no more money, no food on the table, no rent, no nothing out of money. And he made this decision. He said, I'm not going to ask anyone for help. I'm going to pray. I need to know that God will meet my needs. I need that lesson. 
And he put himself in a place where he had to trust God, and he prayed, and the whole story goes, and some, some resources came to him without him ever asking anyone. When I read that, I was a senior in college, and my school bill was 500. I'd already had to take off a whole semester in college because I didn't have enough money for college, and my parents didn't have it. I had to work, so I was already behind. I wanted to go to summer school, but I was at the end of the semester, and I didn't have any money. My parents had promised me $500 they'd forgotten. And I remember so clearly, I was reading it in my journal this past week, where this was such a huge deal to me. And I said, I'm not going to ask my parents for the money. I'm just going to pray that God will remind them. And it was one, uh, one day, three days, five days. I couldn't even register for the next summer school, trying to catch up, wanting to get married. It was such a heavy, not a big deal now, such a heavy deal back then. And I remember the day that I got the phone call, hey, the money's been put on your bill. And I remember the story that I had. God did that for me. I didn't say anything. I didn't do anything. I, now listen to me. You've got to start working on your story. God's done for so, so many of you. I'm not going to ask you to raise your hand, but so many of you already have some installments in this. Things the Lord's done for you. Miracles that God's done in your life. Provisions, healings, uh, incredible things. Changing people's lives, saving family members. Awesome things that God has seen you done. God's given Mo Moses some stories here. And God wants to give you some stories. That's what helps conquer insecurity. I am the Lord. Tell your story about us. Secondly, I am the Lord. I made you perfect for the job. Do you understand that? Look here in the text when, when Moses is like, but, but, but I, but I, but I, but I, 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 I don't talk very good. Verse 11 is awesome. Then the Lord said to him, who has made man's mouth? That's incredible. Notice that God doesn't say, Moses is like, but I, I, I'm not a very good talker. The Lord doesn't say, oh, Moses, you're amazing. Oh, Moses, you're wonderful. Oh, Moses, uh, you're special. Okay? That's not what he says. Moses is like, I'm a, I'm a bad talker. And God's like, I made you that way. Who made your mouth? Now, see, to me, that's a way better answer. I am the way that God wanted me to be. Now, I'm not talking about sin problems. I'm not talking about selfish problems. But I'm talking about personal shortcomings. I'm talking about your strength. I'm talking about your intellect. I'm talking about your articulateness. I'm talking about your confidence. I'm talking about your family of origin. I'm talking about things beyond your control that on a human perspective would inhibit your capacity to serve God. Not things you caused, but things that God allowed that you think are holding you back. And God says, no, no, those are the things that as I begin to really use you are going to keep you humble. I certainly have mine. Moses had his. Who has made man's mouth? Notice how the list expands. Or who makes him mute? Moses wasn't mute. Or deaf, or seeing, or blind. Who makes human frailty? Is it not I, the Lord? Wow. Wow, 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 wow. Why was I born like this? Is it not I, the Lord? That's why the other title. You are perfect for the job. <laughs> Do you get it? You are perfect for the job. You are absolutely fashioned by the Creator in every respect to be 100% effective in the job that He wants you to do. You're perfect for it. Moses, I, I, don't, I don't talk good. You're perfect. That's going to help you depend on me. I am the Lord. I made you perfect for the job. Now therefore go, and I will be with you. There it is. I will be with your mouth. I will teach you what you shall speak. Wow. But he said, oh my Lord, please send someone else. Really? Really, Moses? I am the Lord. Tell your story about us. I am the Lord. I made you perfect for the job. Jot this down. I am the Lord. 
I will make a way for you. Moses still feeling his insecurity, just like, God, really couldn't? Someone's got to be better for this than me. Really? How did you get so far down the list, God? Then the anger of the Lord was kindled against Moses. Look up here. Is God sometimes angry because we refuse to do the things that he's commanded us to do? Is he? Yes, he is. You think it's cool that you never share your faith? You don't disciple anybody. You're not growing as a worship leader. You've got all your reasons. I'm not perfect. I'm not blah, blah, blah. Then the anger of the Lord was kindled against Moses, and he said, look, Moses, is there not Aaron your brother? I know that he can speak well. How did God know that he could speak well? <laughs> Silly question. <laughs> he made him. I know that he can speak well. Behold, he's coming out to meet you, and when he sees you, he will be glad in his heart. He's ready, Moses. He wants to help you. I know this better than any per other person, that if there's any blessing on our church, if there's any fruitfulness in what we've given 20-plus years of our life to, it is less about the person that you're looking at now and more about the people that God put around us. My wife, my assistant, Kathy Elliott, Pastor Rick Donald and his wife, the corn, I could just go down the list of the people that really are the story of God's sustaining work here. And God didn't ask Moses to be everything. God didn't ask Moses to do it all. He put people around Moses to support his insecurity. But the best thing that God did was not the people he put around. Verse 15, you shall speak to him and put the words in his mouth, and I will be with your mouth and with his mouth. I will be with, there it is, and with and with. He shall speak for you to the people, and he shall be your mouth, and you shall be to him as God. The best in all of that, of course, is I am the Lord. I will surround you with people. I am the Lord. I will be with you. Look up here for a minute. Will you allow the Lord let me put that picture up again. Here's the picture. All right? That's what fills the gap. Only that. Just the Lord. Just the Lord. Nothing else ultimately. The Lord through people, the Lord himself, the Lord is the one that fills the gap. And you're not going to experience that until you get out, step out by faith and begin to trust God. Some of you here, listen, some of you here, you have great dreams about what God could do in your life. You, you, you've been... You've been racing your engine with some ideas about how God could use you, and you need to launch out by faith and trust the Lord to be everything that he wants you to be. He'll fill up what's lacking in you. My insecurity eclipsed by the Lord's security. My inability empowered by the Lord's ability. Do you believe that?